Hi everyone, I think we'll get started uh, with the first panel of the day. Uh, and today we have Nora Lesserson from the University College London as our discussant. And I'll pass the mic to her to introduce the panelists. Uh, and then uh, we have two speakers on Zoom today. Uh, and then one uh, is present here. Um, unfortunately, our speakers couldn't be here because of the visa situation. I had to know about that. Um, and um, so, thank you. And, yeah. Welcome, everybody. This is our panel on technologies of communication and identity making. I think it's fitting, actually, that we're coming from Zoom because. It is a technology of communication, and we're making our identity in as theory, a at least. scholar. <laughs> Miscommunication and communication. Uh, our panelists today are Natasha Parnu from Macquarie University. Uh, I probably sound, made that sound French. It's in Australia. Diana Kazarian in Kazmani Peter Catholic University, and Shushan Kazarian from the Armenian Genocide Museum and Institute. And so I'll let them get started. I think Natasha is going to go first. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we have another. Okay, so then I'll just share my screen. Is that right? Yes. And let me uh, highlight. Like so. I think you're good to go, Natasha. Great. Okay, hello, everyone. So, the 5th century was a watershed period in Armenian history. The sustained Sasanian Byzantine Wars of late antiquity presented Armenia with a series of major crises, uh, internal turbulence, sustained military conflict, and religious disputes. Uh, indeed, Armenian literature was the byproduct of Christian times, uh, and it went hand in hand with the Cultural Revolution wrought by the conversion of Armenia. The 5th to 8th centuries showcase a clear shift in literary modes of communication from the traditional oral culture of pre-Christian uh, Armenia to the liturgical and the religious texts, um, and then moving into the development of histories. Today, my paper will trace the evolution of Armenian identity, focused primarily on the histories, um, the way that it was envisioned by the writers of the 5th all the way into the 8th centuries. So this literature engages with a uh, fundamental question. What did it mean to be Armenian? So early historians, such as uh, Mopsas Koranatsi or Agathangelos, uh, they stress the importance of Christianity for Armenia. They are preoccupied with writing Christian past for their current Christianity, whilst other historians from sort of the middle to the late 7th century, such as Vazar uh, Parpetsi or Sebios, construct um, an Armenian political identity that was in unison with the Sasanian Shalon Shahs. Therefore, we can observe an evolution of Armenian identity as twofold, the personal um, and the political, and both were unsurprisingly intertwined. So, firstly, what did the state of Armenia look like in late antiquity? So the Armenian kingdom occupied a middle ground, quite literally, between the Iranian and the Byzantine sphere of influence. Considered once part of Iran Shah, or the homeland of Iranians, uh, the kingdom of Armenia came in and out of influence of the Sasanian Shah, Shah, the king of kings, and the Roman emperors um, from the reign of Shakur II in 309 CE all the way to 628 CE with the defeat, uh, sorry, with the fall of the Sasanian Empire from the Arab conquests. So at the end of the fourth um, century, uh, Arsaic and Armenia was partitioned into Byzantine and Iranian sectors, with the final Arsaic monarch uh, removed in 428 CE. So Armenia was essentially left with no monarch and no leadership to withstand the wars uh, between the Sasanian and the Byzantine empires. So the historians of this period were undergoing a very serious attempt in reconstructing their cultural identity. Uh, having shared cultural and religious practices with the Persians, they were now navigating what it meant to be Christian in their landscape. 
This period is also characterized by very intense religious disputes. By the end of the fifth century, there was a great rupture between the Roman and the Byzantine churches. So, writing the conversion. Um, the, the spread of Christianity had a profound effect on the cultural and political life of late antique Armenia. Uh, as I mentioned, Armenian literature was the byproduct of Christian times quite literally, right? The alphabet was created by the learned aesthetic professor of Washington to translate religious texts from Greek and Syriac into Armenian. Uh, Mr. Moshdot and uh, the Ghatoli uh, Ghost Sahak uh, directed a massive effort to render into Armenian as much Christian literature as possible, uh, resulting in a huge Armenian Christian library for the elite. The first, uh, sorry, the first original work written in Armenian, uh, that is, that was not a translation, was Esnik Kolbatsi's On God. This was a theological um, treatise that was focused on critiquing the various forms of dualism prevalent in Armenia. So Kolbatsi refutes pagan beliefs in defense of a monotheistic faith and deconstructs at length the Zervanet form of Zoroastrianism, which was common in Armenia in this period. The text was the, was the earliest attempt to undermine current pre-Christian Armenian beliefs and build in its place an urgency for conversion. From this period onwards, the Armenian alphabet ushered the production of histories that were focused on rewriting Armenian history. Now, Armenian writers were tasked with synthesizing their ancient pagan heritage in the face of newly emerging religion. For example, uh, Moses Horanazi, uh, he traces the ancestry of the mythical hive all the way to Abraham, uh, somehow connecting the Armenian heritage with biblical ancestry to assert a Christian past for their current Christianity. So Argus Angelos' vision of St. Gregory forms the standard narrative of conversion. So this was translated and circulated widely. Uh, so during the, the vision, um, the Lu uh, sorry, a, a Loomis man appears, um, and he makes references to the last times with the goats who represent the Armenians before their conversion, the lambs post conversion, and finally the wolves uh, who represent the Armenians who did not accept um, Christianity. So, this apocalyptic vision of Armenian society um, basically um, is positioned between good versus evil, uh, or lambs versus wolves, which symbolized Armenia's old pagan life and its new uh, Christian society. The most significant part of this vision is the instruction of the luminous man to build a church at the royal city um, of Bogorshapat, which is modern day um, Echmiadze. So this symbolizes for the first time the unification of church and state. Here a new leadership model was, uh, was offered through the patriarchate of Bogorshapat, basically acting as the spiritual and the political leader of the Armenian people. Uh, this was a significant break from the leadership models of the Arsenic period where a single monarch ruled the Kingdom of Armenia. Now, for the first time, the unification of church and state was presented as the sole solution for Armenian political independence. By firmly situating the conversion within a political perspective, the text presents a pressing choice to the Armenian people basically to remain faithful to the pagan past and be lost, or to convert to Christianity and follow uh, this, the, royal, the royal capital um, of Olga Shabbat and be free, both spiritually and politically. So indeed, the apocalyptic vision of St. Gregory cannot be underestimated in the development of a nascent sort of independent Armenian um, identity. So from this period on, the fusion of the Armenian church with the state formed the sort of uh, the sort of basis of um, Armenian uh, political sort of narratives. So it's important to note that this apocalyptic vision of Saint Gregory and his swift conversion of the of the Armenian people. That um, I think the narrative is that uh, the state was converted within seven to ten days. This sort of narrative formed the mainstream. Um, Armenian historiography. 
But instead of a clear transition from paganism to Christianity, which was sort of celebrated in the Armenian historiographical tradition, the Buzangaran Batushun or the Epic Histories shows the prevalence of Zoroastrianism um, and pagan beliefs among the Armenian uh, Naharars or the elites. So it's uh, the text was also sort of important because it showcased the role of the everyday people uh, in their conversion um, of the Armenian people. So this text was considered um, blasphemous um, in the period and was hardly referenced by other historians. So even in the modern period, right, we didn't actually have a sole translation of this text up until I think the middle sort of 1900s. So for our purpose, it reveals another narrative though uh, which was the construction of Armenian uh, Christian identity from the micro level, but ultimately also it shows the suppression of this narrative. So moving on to the construction of Armenian political identity. So the conversion of Christianity held a mirror to the very fabric of Armenian political identity. The historians of this period politicised the Armenian church quite heavily, and this is because it was the political and the spiritual head of the Armenian people. This seminal shift is best demonstrated in Lazar Parkets' history, which narrates the revolt against the Sasanians in 450 CE um, and the well-known battle of Avarar. So the battle is essentially set up um, sort of as a struggle between vice and virtue, uh, in which Armenians are fighting for their ancestral customs. Um, yeah, this is, this is sort of a little bit ironic because obviously Christianity was not an ancestral uh, religion in that time. So it's sort of more correct to assert that Armenians in this period were sort of, pra um, sort of fighting for their right to practice Christianity in the Sasanian Empire. So Lazar was deeply concerned that Armenian elites would soon return to pagan ways and that they would drift from the Armenian church towards the Church of the East. This is a significant distinction because the Armenian, sorry, because the Christian Church of the East was the Byzantine Church, and therefore this church was considered uh, heretical to Armenian Christianity. So any such shift to foreign churches would threaten Armenian political and cultural independence. So allegiance to the true church, uh, which was the Armenian Church, meant the same Shah and Shahs were less suspicious of an Armenian alliance with Iran's enemy, the Byzantine court. So Lazar basically recognises the centuries-old political relationship between the Armenians and the Sasanians. For example, the Persian king Mir Narsan is quoted as describing Vartan Momigonyan as a man of courage who assisted the Lord of Iran and that his actions were greatly remembered across Iran Shah. Um, similarly, uh, Vartan refers to the Persian kings, and I quote, as our natural laws, and we, the Armenians, are your natural subjects. Loyal service to the Persian kings maintained the centuries-old status quo for the Armenians, and in this period, it had practical consequences for the Armenian elites. This is best demonstrated by the legendary Mamikonans, who were much revered in the um, Armenian literary tradition. The Mamikonians decided to revolt as the Persians would not sign a religious treaty. So in exchange for Armenians maintaining military support and the autonomy of the Armenian elites, the Nakharars, the Persians agreed to the Navarsak Treaty. The Mamikonians, ironically, were appointed as Mars Bonds or governors for their service to the Persian court. So I think this story really demonstrates that it was possible to remain faithful to the Armenian Christian tradition and serve the Sasanian court. So Vazar presents this sort of service as the very solution to Armenia's political problems, that the loyal service of the Naharars to the Armenian church uh, established the stability within the Sasanian establishment. And it maintained the, the centuries old status quo. Now, the Naharars were a stratified social order that shaped Armenian political life, and they had strong sort of blood ties that went back, you know, centuries with the Sasanian aristocracy. Um, so they were sometimes the wives, the cousins, the uncles, etc., with the Sasanian um, aristocracy. So to the aristocracy and thus to Vazor Parketsi, the solution 
to think to Armenia's independence does not rest with Christianity alone, but rather the sole allegiance to its native Armenian church, the one that was protected by the ruler of the Armenian ancestral lands, the Shah Shahs. Now, by the time we get to Sebios' history, there definitely exists a particular Armenian worldview, one that was increasingly confident about its position and identity against the two superpowers. While Sebios um, clearly demonstrates the continued calamity of the 6th century, uh, he narrates, uh, for example, the wars uh, between Iran and the Byzantine Empire. The Armenian crisis in this text is as much political as it is religious. For the Byzantine emperors, Maurice and Heraclius, were forcing Armenia into uh, a religious union with the Byzantine church. But again, in this period, Christianity itself could not save the Armenian people in this text. Uh, and in, fa in fact, the villain in this text was the figurehead of the Holy Roman Church. So Sebios' narration of uh, Hosro's sorry, um, of Hosrael to his Armenian wife, uh, gives us a very clear indication of this Armenian worldview and the Armenian position in the Sasanian court. So the Byzantine Emperor Maurice requests the return of a body believed to be the prophet Daniel. So he demands that the prophet's body must be returned to a Christian land. So Hosrael initially agrees, but upon hearing his wife's dismay, so uh, Shireen's dismay, uh, he retracts his order. So Shireen sort of demands that Daniel's body must remain, and I quote, in its ancestral land, the only true Christian land of Iran Shah. We can see a division here between imperial Byzantine orthodoxy and Armenian Christianity. So Shireen acts as an extension of Armenia, sort of as a mouthpiece for the local Christians who had been exiled from imperial Byzantine Christianity. And it's significant in this story that Hosrael agrees to his wife's request, requests not to return the body. Similarly, when Hosrael dies, he decrees that all Christians in his dominion must hold to the faith of the Armenians. Now, whilst no such sort of you know, evidence points uh, to this decree, uh, I think this story highlights the the influence of Armenia's ideological break with Byzantine orthodoxy on Armenian identity. Uh, the story definitely reflects the significant position of Armenians in the Sasanian Empire, who were rejected and ignored by the Byzantine Emperor, despite the Byzantine Emperor pertaining to be the defender of all of Christendom. So the consequences of these religious disputes then were not all negative for Armenia because its status greatly improved at the Persian court. From as early as 410 CE, the Persian Shah and Shah recognized all the prerogatives enjoyed by the Christian emperor um, for himself on Persian soil. So essentially the Persian king took the same time as that the Byzantine emperor had in protecting um, Christians in his land. So it's obvious that by the late 6th century, uh, any remaining allegiance with the Byzantine emperor um, was well and truly over, and that Armenians were increasingly faithful to and benefiting from the Sasanian Shamanshahs. So what can we conclude about the evolution of Armenian identity? The changing political and religious world of late antiquity saw Armenian intellectuals engage in a widening conversation about their position in the Byzantine and Sasanian worlds. The adoption of Christianity prompted the largest point of departure from tradition, prompting a new narrative focus. To sort of answer one of the questions of our uh, conference today, what shaped Armenian narrative practices, I suppose Armenian literature was was born during a desperate struggle through which to preserve and reconstruct itself. The small group of writers tasked with recording the deeds of their sponsors left a very permanent mark on the way in which later Armenians would view their own Christian origins. The religious disputes in this period with Byzantine 
forced Armenia to strengthen its native church and receive protection by the Sasanian Empire rather than assimilate with Byzantine orthodoxy. Conceivably, this period of chaos then was crucial for the development of a nascent, independent Armenian identity. Thank you. Yes, we can. But we don't see your video. Right, we don't see you. We see your screen, but we don't see you. Nor do we hear you. You're muted, Fiona. Fiona, are you there? I'm here. Okay. Um, I'm here. Hello, everyone. I'm trying to. I was trying to switch on my camera while sharing my screen. Maybe there was something wrong. Because, um, Can you share your screen again now? Yeah, let's try again. Yeah, let's do it again. So you see it? Yes. Yes. Great. And can um, Oh, okay. Maybe you should have the slides and make sure she gets it. Yeah, maximize yeah. the right. Yeah, I will do this. Great. Is it okay now? It's yes. good. Thank you. So, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be a part of this wonderful conference, though virtually uh, I'm very uh, grateful to be here and um, to all the members of the team standing behind uh, this, uh, the organization and implementation of this wonderful conference. Uh, so my, uh, the topic of my presentation, which I'm uh, going to present in a second, is through the lens of history, photographic modes of inhabiting the Holy Land by 19th and 20th century Armenians. Um, now, what we see is a portrait of the Armenian Patriarch of Jerusalem, Yesaik Arabidyan, taken by um, American photographer Charles Bierstadt in the 1870s. This clergyman with an authoritative image was also the first practitioner of photography in Jerusalem, later opening the first photographic school there. Arabidyan deeply influenced the development of photography in the Ottoman Empire, a fact that impressed even the contemporary travelers for example, French traveler Jules Hoche, while traveling in the Holy Land in mid 1880s, highlighted the presence of the photographic culture in his words to be unique to Jerusalem within Armenian community. And of the quote. So, what does it mean to be both a spiritual leader of a community and a photographer? What does this tell us about the intersection of the history of photography? and the Armenians in Jerusalem in an Orientalist landscape. Let's have a short glimpse at the history of Jerusalem Armenians. The history of Armenians in Jerusalem is largely connected to the Armenian quarter, which is one of the four sectors of the walled old city of Jerusalem. The Armenian quarter in its turn is an inseparable part of the Armenian Patriarchate, with the St. James Monastery as its center. The monastery started operating in the 5th century, when the Armenian church refused to accept the Chalcedonian. The caliphate of the 7th century gave the abbot of the Armenian congregation equal rights with the Greek 
Patriarch of Jerusalem. The Patriarchate is the de facto administrator of the quarter. The lay community residing within the walls of the Patriarchate is another group of population, like the clergy. The number and living conditions of Armenians fluctuated mainly decreased over the centuries as a consequence of different rulers in the Holy Land, such as Mamluk and Ottoman periods, British Mandate, Jordanian, then Israeli state periods. During the nearly 400 years of Ottoman rule, the Christian communities were mainly oppressed until the introduction of the Milan system. The Milan system referred to the Ottoman administration of separate religious communities that acknowledged each community's authority in regulating its internal affairs, primarily through independent religious court system. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, court system and schools. The Armenian village organized around the Armenian Apostolic Church in the absence of its own political, secular, or state institutions, managed to preserve Armenian culture and identity due to the mainly its increasingly powerful church. Of course, Jerusalem, being part of the Ottoman Empire, was organized in a similar manner. The Armenians of the Empire managed to get involved in various fields of social life, including the craft of photography. The end of the 19th century was distinguished by a great number of brilliant Armenian photographers and their command of the market of photography production in major cities throughout the Ottoman Empire. The Armenian Abdullah brothers can be regarded as not worthy in the 1850s who were among the first to make significant contributions to the development and spreading uh, of photography in the Ottoman Empire. They were appointed as court photographs by Sultan Abdul Aziz and later opened another branch of the studio in Cairo. Some other major Armenian photographers are Gabriele Vigianimidji, Antoine Sevukin in Persia, Grigor de Revontian in Georgia, and David Rostomian in Baku. When looking at a larger context of early photography in the Holy Land, it can be seen that the documentation of Palestine began decades previously, as early as the 1850s. Initially, this was only seen through the eyes of short-term Western visitors, travelers, explorers, adventurers, missionaries, and the like. But the locals were eager to embrace the new medium of photography as well. At the time when the Abdullah brothers had become famous in Istanbul, facing no significant competition, Jerusalem was a place for experiments in photography. Patriarch Yesaida Abedia opened the first photographic school towards the end of the 1850s in St. James Monastery. This school played a leading role in the spreading of the craft of photography residing in the Levant. The school trained both Armenian and Arab photographers like Harutim Stepanyan, Sarkis Stepanyan, Chichekan, Lumpen, Sarapet Grikorea, Fadil Rad, and others. In later decades, such photographers as Johannes Grikorean, Yusuf Tumanyan, Yasekin Gevor, Sarapet Yazidjan, and Geram Jagaya emerged in the Jerusalem Armenian photographic environment. The history of photography is closely related to the philosophy of photography. So when talking about the one, it's necessary to give some insights about the other. According to Susan Sontag, one of the 20th century's brilliant philosophers of photography, the Latin saint Memento Mori captures the essence of photography by indicating participation in somebody's or something's mortality vulnerability and war notability. The history of photography itself can be narrated as a struggle of two imperatives, that of truth-telling, including its scientific qualities and uses, and beautification, which comes from the fine arts. Besides merely creating a visual presentation of the past, photography participates in core dynamics, as Sontag observes in On Photography. Another conception suggested by French philosopher Roland Barthes 
is the idea of photography as an indicator of present absence. While holding a photograph of a dead person, one can see the presence of that person. So the presence of the photograph will mark the absence of the dead. Martin Chagnon, the French Armenian philosopher, argues that photographs have the ability to embrace loss. Photographs, therefore, represent not only the object or its visibility, but the two together, assuming the existence of the eternal present. present. Um, talking about Middle Eastern photography, one has to consider one more aspect as well, that is the discourse of Orientalism. As pointed out by the influential Palestinian-American scholar Edward Said, the term Orientalism was particularly used in the 19th century, often as a facet of Romanticism, to refer to the depiction of the Near, Middle, and Far East, the Orient, so to speak, primarily by Western artists. Images of history, everyday life, monuments, landscapes, portraits, etc., depicting the life and culture of the geographic region that included modern-day Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, the Arabian Peninsula, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, sometimes modern Greece, and even far east towards Japan, constituted the realm of Orientalism. In short, Orientalism carries the Western vision towards the Orient to dominate, restructure, and have, or have authority over it. When talking about the photography in Jerusalem, a little um, historical part. Photography came in Jerusalem in uh, 1839, uh, the same year when Jacques Louis Duggar proclaimed his discovery to the rest of the world. By 1885, there were approximately 250 different photographers, mostly Europeans, working in the Near East. Armenians and Greeks were the first to found studios because while there was a portrait tradition in royal circles, Islamic faith condemned the portrayal of the human body, and Muslims were unwilling to be photographed. Moreover, Armenians were accomplished painters, craftspeople, people, especially pharmacists, chemists, and goldsmiths. So Armenians, with the knowledge of chemistry required for the daguerreotype process, easily adopted the craft of photography. In such places as Jerusalem, the Armenian patriarch Yisai Garabedian was the first one to practice it and later teach youngsters. Him standing on the roots of photography in the Middle East highlights Armenian tradition in the field as bearers of ritualism and authority. The peak of this kind of representation is this portrait of Yisai Garabedian, taken by Charles Birstad, as uh, previously mentioned, an American photographer. The image, which is a stereographic one, represents the patriarch sitting in a decorated chair, dressed in black, typical to Armenian Catholic uh, church clothing. The priestly ornament that adorn his chest and the staff send more symbol, uh, symbols of ecclesiastical leadership. A calm but balanced position creates an environment of rigor. The fact that a person engaged in the craft of photography appears in front of a Western photographic lens builds an assertive um, setting around the photograph. With this portrait, the author of the photograph, who was of a Western culture, and a person photographed, a leading figure of the local Armenian community, come to prove the fact that Armenian presence in Jerusalem in the late 19th, early 20th centuries was of a mediator position. In other words, on one hand, Armenians stood as locals, allowing the Westerners to photograph them. On the other hand, the example of Yisai Garabedian shows that they also practiced photography by taking pictures of the locals. In this sense, uh, the study of some other photographic modes from the late 19th to uh, mid 20th century period comes to reflect Armenians' attempt to stay neutral between the locals and the Westerners. As mediators, Armenians as if took a step back from the discourse of de-orientalizing themselves 
and orientalizing the locals. In fact, this um, mediative act did not derive from a naive, oblivious, oblivious position. Rather, the Armenian photographers were able to effectively arbitrate between the local community and the Western people because of their comprehensive grasp, their own important importance as fully integrated members of society. Being Christians, thus appearing to be in greater proximity to Europeans, but in predominantly Muslim environment, Armenians took advantage of the apparatus on their hands, the camera, which was used to capture the local others while being on the other side of it. Meanwhile, the self-orientalizing act showed their full integrity in the society. Even though to the, the efforts to find at least uh, one photograph taken by Saigon, Yan has not been uh, successful. The photographs of one of his dedicated apprentices, Rabbit Rikoyan, are simply regarded as such. In this way, one might argue that in some way um, the Armenians exoticize themselves from the locals in front of the Western comprehension, being also fully integrated into the environment they lived and work. One such example is the photograph of the Kurkan family wearing Palestinian costumes, taken by the <coughs> photographer Karabitri Korea. Another one, stressing the oriental background of the, of the land, the occidental gaze or presenting there, and a photographer's mediatory position within this environment is a photograph by Karabet Grigorian studio representing Western tourists standing on the steps <coughs> of the Rome of the Dome of the Rock, an Islamic shrine located on the Temple Mount in the old city of Jerusalem. This is a brilliant example of a photograph, not only in its compositional setting, but also on this cursive foundation. The foreground of the photograph represents a group of men, locals, presumably guides, and tourists standing on the steps of the mosque. In the background, the magnificent gates of the mosque rise, and behind it is the mosque itself as an expression of perfect architectural thought. The photograph is the reflection of all the above-mentioned uh, statements about the oriental background, the occidental gaze and the presence of a neutral photographer fixing the moment. With this example, the process of the uttering is quite visible within visibility of the photographer, most probably Karapet Virikuya. We see people of Western culture photograph in front of a mosque. The photographer here acts as a mediator that creates li links, sorry, <clears throat> that creates links between newcomers and the local environment. The link, the tie in this case, is the photograph itself, that together with the photographer becomes a mediating bridge between two cultures. This is where the specificity of the Armenian photographic presence in Jerusalem reveals itself. Examples of specifically Armenian photography in such an orientalist, orientalist landscape can be found from the British mandate period as well. Correspondingly, photographs by Elia Gavrucha can be regarded as such. In the photos of Bedouin girl by a fountain or a Palestinian woman smoking a pipe, one can see two women of different ages preoccupied with their daily activities. These women are being subjected to an orientalist case in a manner specific to Gavrucha. The Armenian photographic presence in the Holy Land captures the quite fascinating image. Even though used as a neutral term to describe the geographical territory that was part, once part of the Ottoman Empire, then became a British mandate and is divided between Israel and Palestinian territories, in the framework of this study, study of Holy Land in place mainly to the city of Jerusalem, being the pilgrimage destination of both Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Jerusalem gained credence to encompass an ecumenical environment for these religions. Over centuries, it has become a place for interreligious and intercultural crisscrossing. 
The photographic traces of Armenians in Jerusalem examined in the frames of this research are a selection of three different archives, Project SAFE, Armenian Photograph Archives, Library of Congress and Malikia Photography Collection. These photographs come to show the shift made by the Armenians in the Orientalist discourse by the othering themselves while exoticizing the locals. In this special discursive position, they to some extent distinguished, if not resisted, their otherness. Meanwhile, they were so integrated into the society that they sometimes got orientalized by Europeans too. The act of mediation firstly came to be employed as a mode of communication, media. Secondly, as a discursive understanding. One could argue that the act of mediation assumed by the Jerusalem Armenians carried an interreligious, intercultural, intercommunal, and ecumenical frame. This reflects the historical diversity and cosmopolitan nature of the Armenian photographers in the Holy Land, which in turn contributes to the understanding of a broad Armenian diasporic presence. Thank you very much. about a unique phenomenon observed during and after the Armenian genocide, the preservation of sacred objects and the transmission of the related survival stories to the generations. In this context, a sacred object is most often an object saved from Western Armenia, Cilicia, and various settlements of the Ottoman Empire. Armenian Christian culture that is that are um, manuscripts, ritual prayer books, hamanids, prayer scrolls, etc. Another case is when, when an object became associated with the memory of martyrdom and struggles of the Armenians. The purpose of this research is not the study of the phenomenon of the home saints or other sacred objects, about which there are already a number of publications, but rather 
Extraction and Study of Armenian Genocide Narratives and Memory Transition uh, in the Context of Stories of Home Sense and Sacred Objects. Most accessible sacred object to me is a medieval hamayili, an Armenian word, or rather two pieces of hamayils, Armenian Christian prayer scrolls, encased in a small leather case containing this handwritten uh, hamayils decorated with miniatures and cross-shaped prayers, two pieces of shushba, embroidered pieces of handkerchiefs are also deposed with them. On one of them, it is written uh, from Aziz to Hamayil, the gift of, of April 3, 1955. Here the personification of scroll is seen, because the common noun Hamayil is written as proper noun with capital letter. The other is uh, probably a factory made, made shushba with a printed pattern, you see it here, and uh, who inserted it with the hamayil is unknown. The following four traditional attitudes have been formed around the same in our family. Uh, on Shabbat or on Saturdays, to light a candle in front of the hamayil's box, do not open, do not look, although as I understand it, uh, the stronger this instruction was, the greater the tradition of uh, opening and looking at it was. Then, do not take it out of the house, putting pictures of relatives inside the box, under the leather case, so that the state protects them and gives them health and success. Always putting the hamayl in the same place, never putting in a bedroom, uh, placing in the living room. I heard about the Armenian genocide for the first time through the story attached to this home saint of our house. As a child, I was first told about our grandfather Hachik's story of the Armenian genocide survival due to my question about the Hamayil and its meaning. My grandmother started the story of my grandfather from the Western Armenia and the Armenian genocide. Later on, I repeatedly was asking her to tell the story of the Hamayil and my grandfather, and thus the Armenian genocide narrative among us grandchildren was being constructed around our home saint. I remember as a child, we encountered this phenomenon of specific sainthood, and the keeper of Hamayils and the narrator of the Armenian genocide survivor and martyrdom story was the same person, my grandmother Shushi, uh, grandfather Haji's wife. Can I just check something? Okay. I want to make sure that they can hear you. Sure. Sorry. the Armenian Genocide. His name was Hachi Gevorki Hachatyan and was born in 1910 in the village of Noshen, located in the Artske Aljavas district of the province of Van, Western Armenia. His mother, Gyozal Muradi Lepudyan, and sister, Mariam Gevorki Hachatyan, also survived. They later told my grandmother, Shushik, my uncles and aunt, about uh, the horrors they lived through. 
In spring 1915, my great-grandfather Gebo was arrested with other Armenian men, taken out of village and shot dead. They took the deportation route from Uvan to Eastern Armenia. Khachik and Marian were the only survivors among the children. And the only relic that remains uh, from the deportation road are above mentioned miles kept in the Khachatrians, our family, house today. On the way of refuge, Khachik's mother, Gyozal, gets familiar with the 13-year-old sixth son of Armenian priest who was carrying the mentioned prayer scrolls in a leather case. The teenager had been probably warned to take it off before the call of nature, to put it in a separate place and then to tie it again. And at some point, Gyoza's sister Hamayel case left on a stone and the boy disappeared, probably forgetting to tie it again at some point in the long journey of deportation. Gyoza decides to take it so that if she sees the boy, she will give it to him. But she does not meet him anymore and keeps the prayer scrolls as a sacred object at the house. At the end of her life, she hands it over to her daughter-in-law, Shushik, in order to keep it carefully as a sacred object, never to open, never to take it out of the house, and to light a candle every Saturday evening, that is Kirak Namud. And now the keeper of this object is another member of our family. This survived object has become a generational family relic during the last hundred years, although it initially belongs to another family. Thus, it transmits not only one story concerning the Armenian genocide, but four of them. Story of deportation road, story of law, story of family survival, the story of a priest unknown son, story of a relic. Another story is Serok uh, Torosian's uh, family story and the Bible related to it, to this story. Uh, the Bible belonged to the family uh, of Arab Girtsi Serok Torosian, born in Maden. Uh, we assembled, assembled this story from uh, a memoir at AGMI collection, Armenian Genocide Museum Institute. The story was recorded by Serok Torosian's son, Grigor Torosian, in January 1970. By means of bribing a Turkish neighbor, Serok's mother redeems her two sons, twice to save them from exile. The only sacred family relic remains this printed Bible, which the memoirist calls Avetaran, that is gospel. After the death of his mother, Serop is adopted by the Turkish Yusuf Aha, who also had killed his Armenian shoemaker master, Hako, in front of the boy. Left with no choice, the boy accepts the offer to convert to Islam and is circumcised, changing his name to Nuri. He wraps the Bible in a piece of leather, then covers it with wax and keeps it in a hole dug in the garden of the Turk Aha's house, keeping it in secret from everyone. Approximately from the spring until the autumn of 1922, the Bible was kept underground, paralleling the time lapse of Serok Terosian forced conversion. When leaving, Serok did not forget to take the Bible with him because it was actually the only relic a memory left from their family. In fact, in fact, this uh, printed family Bible, which is part of the permanent exhibition of the AGMI, is one of the most frequently emphasized material item by the museum's two guides and plays a big role in this matter. Through this Bible, Serok Torosian's story of survival is transmitted to millions of visitors of AGMI each year. Another story is related to Hamais from Mush in Getamaj village of Kotaik region of Armenia. The story of this sacred object, our team of researchers collected in June 29, 2002, the search for Armenian genocide survivor stories provided us this story of Hausen with its manuscript data. 
In this case, our team initially going to collect the story of saint of the house, encounter the small story of survival with the names of the su survivors, Manu Gavetisyan and his mother, Vartan Gavetisyan. Interestingly, the story of the sound of the house is entirely a story of these two Armenian survival, as there were no more details available about this survival. The Avedran of grandmother Rush, 82 years old, uh, the Hamayils, not the Avedrans, are of two pieces, a handwritten ones of 16th century, Bolorgir, Herapet Samayil, and the printed one uh, of uh, 1716, Amirbek Samayil, was brought from the Western Armenia. The saint, as is usually observed, is wrapped in a silk cloth and placed in a leather case, which in turn is placed in an old suitcase, along with shushpas, icons, water, oil and soil brought from Jerusalem. The Hamayas were brought from Mush in 1915 by the mother Vartanush of her husband, uh, Manuk Abedisyan, Rush's husband. The Hamayas literally went through their test of water and fire on the way of migration and two uh, miracles are told to happen on the road. First, the bundle falls into the fire from the pocket of Vartanush, who bends over the tandoor oven to warm herself. But the nice bundle flies out of the fire. The burnt pieces uh, are seen, are noticeable. And when the Turks derive their, drive their uh, caravan into the sea, the word is grandmother word. It's not necessary that it, it could be a sea. Saint pulls the woman out of the sea, thus saving her. The grandmother says that the saint who comes to uh, house, uh, to her house, she indiscriminately tells about the story of Avatana's survival. Mm -hmm. On Friday, Saturday and Sunday, Candles are lit in front of the set. In the past, people were allowed to come with a request for healing and to bring their shushpas. You can just see the pieces of shushpas. Another case is Andrani Kozanyan's commemorative album in U Village. Although the album uh, itself is not a religious unit, as Hamayas and Gospels are, but it is Andranik's persona that has been perceived as heroic and chosen one. A hero, a saint, living martyr who helps those Armenians that are in need. The sacredness around Andranik, as far as I have observed, was formed not only during Andranik's life, but after his death as well. His figure is still in the memories of Armenians by the way Turks and Nazaris uh, perceive him as devil or evil man. Uh, and his figure is of a separate field work study. Uh, direct material for our uh, present topic is the attitude around Andrani's commemorative album in U Village in Armenia. It is preserved in a secret place, it has keepers, and it has it is not known whose idea was to compose this album. The interviewee said that only a handful of people saw it, and she is one of them. Uh, through this album, a story about Andrani, the Armenian genocide stories of self-defense and heroic battles are being told to young generation. The sacral field is being formed, among other factors, through the component of secrecy and reverence. The Armenian genocide narrative is being combined with Andranik's persona narrative of his miraculous birth, baptism, and other stories, usually his miraculous power and heroic capacities. German Armenian Mr. Yedvat Fijitian presents the survival story of his maternal grandmother, Elise. Karipian from the village of Zmara near Sebastia. His grandmother was about 12, 13 years old during the deportation. After the 
hardship of deportation, she settled in Istanbul. And along with the survival story, with scarce information, he pointed out to two objects with sacred meaning that survived the Armenian genocide. One is a printed Bible published in 1896. The other is a picture of St. Gregor Musa Voric. Mr. Fujicha wonders how his grandmother managed to carry that Bible with her because it is quite heavy. The grandmother pointed to the image of St. Gregor Savoric and said that it is important so that they, were never for, they never forget that it is important. Yet, but look, this is a very important picture. It is the picture of Gregor Savoric. You should keep it well. These two memories of survival uh, of Armenian genocide are quite worn, but the sacrality is not affected because of it. This is evidenced by the treatment towards these two objects after the grandmother's death. Mr. Fichichian left Istanbul at the age of 19. Uh, he is now 67. And decides later, when both his grandmother and mother had passed away, uh, returned to Istanbul, taking with him to Berlin these two relics of precious memories, and is considering repairing the Bible, the cover, and four pages of which are missing. You can see here the corner. Uh, this is the usual case that uh, these objects are being put in uh, houses, village houses. Uh, Another secret object. This is a right here in the You have to conclude. Yeah, yeah. And this is, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to answer to your questions. Thank you. than in discussion itself. And I want to make sure we have time to talk all together about some very rich ideas. Uh, thanks to the panel for these very suggestive papers, which have very clear overlaps. They all speak of forms of communication, of course, such as manuscripts, books, photographs, and prayer scrolls that double as devices of mediation. And then through their mediation, they serve as, ob they serve as objects of identity formation. Shushan's objects serve as conversation starters that allow viewers to learn Armenian stories of survival and thus understand Armenians as survivors. Diana's photographs not only serve to connect or mediate their viewers with the stories they tell, but they also serve to portray the Armenian photographers as mediators themselves, as in-between figures who could bridge their local community, the quote, east, with the communities of the quote, west. Uh, finally, Natasha's narratives and history sought to mediate or synthesize Armenians' ancient heritage and traditions with their nascent Christianity. These narratives thus helped Armenians identify as Christians for the first time. Natasha also discusses the development of the Armenian alphabet, another technology of communication, I would argue, which in being used to translate Christian literature in particular, also forged a visual and intellectual relationship between Armenianness or Armenian identity and Christianity. Needless to say, the alphabet itself too became a symbol or expression of Armenian identity, and we see it on the wall outside. So all three of these Armenian identities, should be noted, are themselves identities of mediation or in-betweenness. Armenians as survivors, as people in between life and death, Armenians as mediators themselves between East and West, and Armenians as religious subjects between ancient pagan traditions of Christianity, or perhaps as Christian subjects between empires. 
all of these identities, ah, all of these identities are true or real or whatever you want to call them, and they're also really familiar to us today. So my question for the panel and the audience is, what does it mean when an identity is or was new? For example, as a Christian in the early years of Christianity, versus when identity becomes familiar and practiced. Why do, we invent, why do we invent identities? And do they lose or gain power over time? So identities, of course, serve a social function. When they're new, they create coherence, confidence, and productive boundaries. They offer legibility. And they become familiar for a reason. They allow us to cohere, to endure, to distinguish ourselves, to use a shorthand for what becomes a longer and longer collective history. But what is lost when an identity becomes so familiar? What's gained? Is it possible as a people to create new identities? If so, how? And are forms of mass communication, books, narratives, photographs, religious texts, etc., the primary means of facilitating identity formation? Are there other ways to create collective identity? If not, why are forms of communication so powerful? And how do these forms influence the molds and types of identities themselves? Are we limited? Are we limited by such communication practices or enriched and expanded by them? And finally, are there ways of thinking about being in the world beyond identity? So I guess. Nora, yeah, uh, why don't you two go up? This is awkward, so we'll, we'll uh, Yeah, we'll do our best to figure this out in a way that is semi-functional, I guess. Uh, Natasha and Diana, can you still hear us? We have to unmute. And you should unmute yourselves, right? And um, how people in the room are going to be heard. Uh, I guess. Maybe people can come here. Yeah, if you want to come up here to ask your question or, or somewhere in the neighborhood of this webcam, then you'll be heard more, more clearly. But perhaps uh, the, uh, Natasha and, and uh, the panelists would like to respond to Nora's comments. Can I have a go at one of those questions? <laughs> yes. So, um, Particularly, I think that was the last, the last question that Nora said. I think it was, what's lost when an identity is familiar? Um, and I think for me, as sort of, you know, someone working on the ancient past, I think, uh, you know, the fact that we lost a lot of the pre-Christian uh, sort of views and, you know, religious beliefs, to some degree, it, it sort of limited us because now, in you know, sort of the modern era, the only text that we have to reconstruct our meaning identity in the ancient world is predominantly all sort of a Christian texts that are really sort of you know, hell-bent on saying that you know, we're Christians, we're the right Christians, etc. And we don't have the other side. And there's really only one narrative that stood out. And the other ones, like the Buzandar Al-Qutran, for example, was you know, really marginalised and silenced and, you know, no one really liked that. So I think there's a positive in constructing one identity that, you know, everyone gets around, but it can also be limiting um, rather than sort of enriching because sometimes it can silence um, diversity, which I think can be a problem. Um, so that's my sort of view for one sort of thing that you mentioned. For me, that sort of, you know, stood out the most as sort of an ancient historian. We don't have everything that we want from, you know, the Armenian kingdom because one narrative, you know, stood out and, you know, took away the rest, essentially. that we call survived objects. Mm -hmm. 
are transmitting this Christian memory and rather a folk Christian memory and attitude that inside these scrolls and maybe beside these scrolls there's a sand that is a keeper and uh, by saving these scrolls the Armenians were uh, carrying these saints from Western Armenia and other settlements of the Ottoman Empire with them. So they were carrying this saint also. And in these villages that we were uh, uh, doing these build works, there is still this memory of the saint that they are having this saint in their houses. In Yerevan, it is very much lost. This um, because of secular culture and uh, else. Uh, so the villages are still carrying. And the other thing is when these um, survival names, uh, the, the names of survival are being uh, kept together with the stories of the sacred objects survival. So sometimes they don't even remember how they uh, went through these hardships, where did they left, where did they go, what did they encounter. But they are telling the story of the objects and transmitting through these objects the survival story and the names of the survival. And maybe the names of the survivors are being um, remembered because of this my case that I was trying to present. Jesse? Um, if, if I talk from here, can the people on Zoom hear? Natasha, I'm going to take that one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, my question is for Shushan anyway. But, mm -hmm. um, first of all, I loved your paper. It was so interesting. And I'm so glad you're doing that research to document um, uh, this practice. Um, I have one comment and two questions. So my comment is that I've heard um, talks about this subject before and Don Sur being translated as home saint. But I really think in English, we can't really use saint for anything but a person. Yes. And so it probably makes more sense to say like sacred object or something like that. Mm -hmm. I know you're not the one who's uh, inventing this translation. That's the way it's talked about in scholarship. But in English, it just, our minds go somewhere else when we hear saint, just a comment. Um, but the two questions are, so the instructions were so interesting about not opening the Hamayu, uh, not touching it. And I was wondering um, if you have any idea whether these kind of instructions like predate the genocide and go back to how the, uh, the Damsur was revered and used or not used in uh, Western Armenia and the villages before. Like, were, do those instructions predate uh, the catastrophe or is it something that comes afterwards? Um, whether you have any thought on that, it might be impossible to know. Um, and then the second question is, are any of these ones you found, like the Abadadans or the Dongsurps, do any of them come? It, it, is it the case that in every case, these are objects that survived from Western Armenia and were brought over, or is there any that are like local to villages in Armenia? No. No, only the Armenians. Thank you so much. Uh, about the English uh, accuracy of uh, home saint, uh, those who uh, were carrying out the research on specifically home saints, it is not me. Uh, my uh, interest is solely on the Armenian genocide related issues. They said that. They, uh, the keepers are, they believe that these scrolls, prayer scrolls, they have saint around them. There is a spiritual presence around them, which comes to their mind, which uh, 
they have dreams that some someone comes to say that I am the Hamayu and I order you to take me me from this place to that place. And this is very common uh, in, in this uh, uh, stories that we have in common. Uh, so the saint is not much of a a matter of personification in this case, that's why. In uh, scientific language, we can surely say sacred objects. And consents uh, are folk language, which I try to transmit this uh, attitude. Uh, the other question was on the Armenian genocide. Yeah, the, this uh, object I collected solely from the Armenian genocide related uh, stories uh, in villages and my friends also gave me some pieces of information and uh, photographs and else. But the team of our, uh, our research team uh, started to carry out this research from uh, May 1, uh, the current year, and this is going to be continuous. No, and just real quick, what about the, the instructions like to not open it? Do you ah. know yeah. Uh, well, honestly, I don't know, but I can, I, I assume I, that there was this bad, there was this bad because uh, they were uh, trying to build the secrecy and reverence around these objects. I, I, I'm not sure whether mm -hmm. this is theologically accurate, but yes, they were trying to build the reverence and secrecy around these objects. Maybe not to damage them, maybe not to not to get accessible, uh, make accessible everyone to these objects. Who knows? <laughs> my question is, Shushan. Yeah. Please, please go on. Yeah. And please use the microphones. It will help the people here uh, on okay. Zoom as well. Um, thank you, Shushan, for this fascinating uh, presentation. Actually, uh, my family uh, and Amush knows they, they, uh, where we come from. Our ancestors, they came from Wan, and they brought these Avedarans and Shushbas, but it was before the genocide. Mm -hmm. And they have the same practice, and mm -hmm. uh, for example, my family has a uh, Naregatsi, mm -hmm. and um, um, in my family narrative, they say you cannot read every outlook it can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. You have to to have a um, certain place for that mm -hmm. and the time um, and so on and so forth. So, um, and um, as you, you have shown in your pictures, in our village we have the same thing. And they believe that it's a power of that book that you cannot disturb them, otherwise they're going to revenge and this or, is punish. <laughs> or punish for that and this is, uh, happened with our uh, family when um, someone just stole it from my grandparents' house because it was open for public, people would come pray and someone just took it because, because it was first publication of Narigatsi it was um, um, so um, and then that, that family who took it, they brought it back saying that, oh, this book is punishing, that as, uh, as you had mentioned, the, the, the ghost is coming after us, they take us back, read the book. Go to or an angel. <laughs> or an angel. Or an angel. I don't know. <laughs> they, were, they were so scared, so they brought the book back. So this is kind of something that came from Western Armenia, but it was even before at the genocide. Mm -hmm. So, and people really are uh, afraid to lose that because they are afraid of this punishment which may come after. Um, 
And um, about um, uh, the, uh, the content, because you said Hamai, I was wondering what what was the content of this Hamai? Was it Urpatagi? We know that it, 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 Urpatagi was the main Hamai text, like Avotkne, I don't know. And for in this case, what was it? Uh, or Patagi? Uh, or maybe to our, uh, our house or my... Or no, no. Uh, the, the other one that you showed. Her without? Yes. <laughs> because it looked like it might be uh, Patagi. No, it's not Ur Patagi, mm -hmm. but it had uh, some excerpts from Ur Patagi. By the way, Ur Patagi is uh, an exorcism Armenian book. The first printed book, uh, as everyone knows, in Armenian language. Urpatagik uh, can be a sacred object of Havaos, uh, but mm, this is not mm. the case. There were also uh, proofs from Narek, there were also some instructions how to uh, get pregnant, how to. Uh, Defense themselves from evil eye and so forth. But the pray. So right? there are Hamayids, classic mm -hmm. Hamayids, specifically yeah. Armenian Hamayids. Mm -hmm. Ah, by the way, they, this sacred object can be also like Ahtars, which is not, which are not Christian, uh, mm -hmm. but rather a magic. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, people sometimes they don't. Uh, distinguish between the Hamayas and the uh, Ahtarks. Uh, Hamayas are Christian prayer schools. Ahtarks are magic uh, mm -hmm. instructions of different kind. And there can be also Metzhazaliaks, mm -hmm. which is another magic uh, manuscripts. By the way, we have uh, in Matanagara a number of Metzhazaliaks. And then uh, other pieces even printed uh, pages, uh, torn pages from Gospels, from uh, the Bible, they, they are carrying them. We have one case of a, of a cross that uh, this, uh, uh, this person took uh, their ancestors, his ancestors, took from a Moosh village, no, I'm sorry, one village of Shamiran, and this cross was the cross of their village church, and they are keeping it as a home site as well, mm -hmm. sacred object. Yeah. But thank you so much. I <laughs> you should reason I, 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 I'm <laughs> going to collect <laughs> your story as well. Yeah. I want to make sure we, we are out of time, but if there are any questions. Natasha, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Natasha, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was very. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. This is a fascinating period um, and uh, and a complicated one. And I just wondered, from um, you looked at history writing. I wonder if you have looked at all at archaeology or church architecture, sculpture from the sixth century, and how that might or might not dovetail with what you're hearing in the um, in the historiography. Yeah. Um, look, I actually haven't. I wish I had a better answer for you to have a nice sort of discussion, but I haven't primarily because I'm sort of looking at more of the textual sources. So this, paper came out of a section on um, stuff that I'm doing on the Persian period and you can't actually learn about the Persian Empire without looking at the Armenian sources and then once I found these sources I you know, became obsessed with the Armenian sources and then the paper went a different direction so that's why I haven't actually looked at any sort of archaeological evidence um, but I would love to look at sort of the archaeological remains because there were so many you know, Zoroastrian temples, pagan temples etc in late antique Armenia so I think that would potentially give us a different narrative about you know, how prevalent these religions were even up until the Christian period. You know, the country wasn't, I can't imagine, you know, converted in you know, seven to 10 days, whatever the narrative was. Um, and I 
think the prevalence of those archaeological remains will give us another narrative. But unfortunately, I haven't looked at them, so I can't give you, you know, I can't give you anything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. And thank you very much to our panelists and to Nora Lesserson. We have a coffee break now and then we'll resume. Um, thank you. Hope you came thirsty, Barbara. Yeah. If I can ask the panelists to our uh, Anu Sarkisyan from Mata Nadaran, Jesse Arden, uh, uh, from the Zohab Institute, and Guy Nyarvazian from Harvard University to sit in the front. And then each speaker uh, will present, and we have uh, Christina Marzi uh, from Harvard University uh, as our discussion today. Uh, we're very honored to have her. Uh, you should speak for me. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think you're good. Okay, well, thank you, Zovinar and uh, Chris uh, for organizing and uh, Mark and Bedros, uh, also so much for making the uh, conference possible. So mine's kind of a back history to some of what uh, Shushan was presenting about Humayils. So from the 15th century to the 19th, Humayils were produced and circulated among Armenians. Humayils are talismanic prayer scrolls that contain both sacred and magical texts and images, and measure a few inches in width and extend in length for many feet, sometimes up to 30 or more. The scroll, or roll, was the standard technology for housing literature in antiquity throughout the Mediterranean up until the initial centuries after Christ, when, largely under the influence of the new religion of the book, the codex began to surpass the roll in usage and popularity. The Armenian alphabet was invented in the early 5th century in a Christian environment after the transition from roll to codex had already been solidified. And so when Armenians came to produce books, they naturally made use of the codex only. So there's no Armenian tradition of using the scroll during late antiquity or the Middle Ages, so far as we can tell. So it seems significant that Armenians in the 15th century turned to this ancient literary form at this time and throughout the early modern period. So the questions that I'm bringing to this investigation are who produced these scrolls, who were they produced for, and for what purposes, and why at this time? And I just want to mention that uh, the images of all the scrolls that I'm showing in this presentation are from the Zokrov Information Center in New York. Uh, we have five scrolls, four are manuscripts, and one is printed. So first a bit about Hamayos. Humayils consisted of a somewhat standard repertoire of texts and illuminations. They often began either with a pericope from each of the four Gospels in which Jesus performs a healing miracle, or with the prayer of 24 stanzas composed by St. Nerses Shnonali, known as Havadol Kostobani. There are also prayers, often with accompanying illuminations, directed to the major saints and angels of the Armenian tradition, requesting their intercession and protection. Other prayers, also often with accompanying illuminations, request health and protection from sacred elements associated with Christ and his divine economy of salvation, especially the cross, the crucifixion, Christ in the chalice, the Lamb of God, etc. Other prayers request protection and help for specific occasions or against specific maladies, such as for a woman in pregnancy and labor, travel, mercantile and business activity, protection against various forms of the evil eye, evil tongue, evil occurrences and other calamities, headache and other pains, or against specific deaths, such as the tibla or al, who attack pregnant women and their fetuses. All these prayers typically end with a phrase requesting the help or protection for this servant of God or this servant of yours, after which a space is left to write the name of the owner of the Hamail. And you can see in red uh, here uh, where those names are written in. Other texts present narrative encounters between a saint or angel and various demons in which the saint or angel bind the demon so it is unable to inflict harm. 
Other common texts include Genesis 22, the sacrifice of Isaac, and certain prayers from St. Gregory of Nodak's prayer book. A notable portion of Hamayus is a section containing texts written in a cross-hatch pattern, with decorative crosses interspersed at the intersections of the text. Here, form and content align, as the text in question consists of two parts. First, the sacrifice of Isaac, understood theologically as a typological precursor to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And the second, a prayer for intercession to all the holy signs, or crosses, which includes a lengthy list of monasteries and churches in the Armenian world dedicated to the holy sign or containing a fragment of the true cross. Some Hamayils, especially handwritten ones, contain talismans and charms with patterns of seemingly meaningless numbers, letters, and shapes resembling the Armenian and Arabic alphabets placed in circular or square boxes. So these scrolls are referred to by those who wrote them under various names, including Gibrianos, Hamayil, or actually more commonly Hamayil or Hemayil, Avotaran, site of prayer, Gavabanag, magical protective writing, Gushtabanag, armlet, Pajushkagankir, healing or curative writing, Jar, homily, Kir Bahpanutyangam Bahpanovagan, protective writing, or simply Kir, writing. So it's called Gibrianos after the name of Cyprian of Antioch, who was a pagan sorcerer from the 3rd to 4th century, who converted to Christianity, and about whom a popular narrative story survives in a number of languages. And a version of this narrative is commonly found in the Armenian scrolls. And this figure seems emblematic of the scroll itself. A pagan magician baptized into Christianity seems to mirror the adoption of the Humayil with its magical elements into the Christian medium and context. So the most common name for the prayer scrolls and the one adopted in modern scholarship is Humayil. The traditional etymological explanation connects Humayil with the Armenian root Hamai, which relates to magic, augury, and divination. So we have words like Hamaik or Hamayim. But recent scholarship has suggested a different etymology, connecting it instead with the Arabic root hamala, which has the sense of carrying or bearing. And so the Armenian word hamayil or hamayil would be a borrowing from the broken plural hamayil of the Arabic word himala. And this seems a much more likely explanation, as it is otherwise impossible to account for the forms hamayil and hamayil with that initial vowel which are much more frequently encountered in the colophones of the time than Humayil is, which is the form used today. <clears throat> and this notion of carrying brings to the fore the significant fact that the scroll was meant to be worn or borne by the owner. And indeed, pouches, typically of cloth, but sometimes also of leather, as we saw, were used not only to protect the Humayil from decay, but also so that the Humayil could be worn on the person of the owner or kept in their pocket. Being worn or carried on the person, like a talisman or charm, was obviously understood to bring special protection through its proximity. In the Ethiopian tradition, which has the most analogous type of scrolls, and which also issued from the same period, the scrolls match the height of the client they are made for, which underscores the direct physical connection between the scroll and the person it is meant to protect. So with all of this kind of background in place, we can return to those initial questions of who made these, who they make them for, and how were they used. So previous scholars have generally been very vague in answering this latter question, simply stating that Pemayils were believed to offer protection and healing to their owners. James Russell, on the other hand, has offered a more specific suggestion, claiming that the principal aim was always to protect women and childbirth. There's also been a general assumption, mostly undemonstrated, that Hamayils were made and circulated outside the purview of church authorities who were generally hostile to them. Russell, for example, has argued that those who made them in the Armenian context were Diratsus, who he identifies as unordained Christian religious practitioners, 
and has attempted co to connect with the Debteras of the Ethiopian tradition, marginal figures or outsiders, not unlike magicians, who were looked upon askance by the official clergy. In conducting my research, I read as many colophones of handwritten hamiles as I could find, about 100 or so. Unfortunately, the 550 that are at the Madanataran, I didn't have any access to. Uh, to see what could be discovered about the persons who made and acquired the Hamayils. So, as for those who made them, colophones indicate persons with the moniker scribe, Kudich, drawer, Kudzoh, illuminator, Zavgarar, priest, Yeretz de Kahana, monk, Apeva, deacon, Sarkavak, Diratsu, Tabir, secretary, Kardular, and Mahdasi, which is a pilgrim. And colophones mention as acquirers of the Hamayils people with the following monikers priest, Yeretz Der, monk, Apeva, Tabir, Chalavi, Baron, Mahdasi, Haji, village chief, Res, merchant, Choja, doctor, Hekim, goldsmith, Boskerich, woodworker, Dovramaji, and in one instance, a youth or adolescent, Badami, was mentioned as the recipient. And although far less frequently than men, it's significant that, not uncommonly, women are also mentioned as the acquirers of Himayils, either alone or along with their husbands, sometimes preceding their husband's name as the principal acquirer, sometimes following them. Uh, despite this fact, the claim of James Russell that the principal aim of the scrolls was always to protect women in childbirth seems untenable in light of the above evidence, as well as the contents of Himayils, and is in need of modification. Protecting women in childbirth was one purpose among several. But there's several observations that can be drawn from the investigation of the colophones. First, it's striking that many of the makers were priests, ordained clergy. In fact, they account for the largest number of makers for those I investigated. Secondly, a number were members of the minor orders, deacons, diratsus, tabirs. And uh, uh, disagreeing with what Russell said, the idea that Diratsus were marginal or outsider figures working in opposition to the wishes of the ordained clergy is entirely conjectural and seems misleading, especially in light of the fact that there were also many other makers of Hamayils, including most frequently ordained clergy. Also, many of the texts included in Hamayils, like the healing gospels, the prayers of St. Gregory of Nadek and their Shonali are also used in healing services found in official liturgical books of the Armenian Church like the Mashtos. So all of the above should lead to caution in assuming that Himayils were scorned by the clergy or other members of the official church hierarchy. Rather, what we seem to be dealing with here is a tradition with, with origins predating Christianity that has subsequently been baptized and brought into Christian usage. All our extant Hamayils seem to issue from a markedly Christian environment. And uh, more investigation is needed to kind of clarify this relationship. As for those who acquired and used them, it's striking how the professions mentioned cover the entire range of early modern Armenian society. Priests, monks, community and village leaders, pilgrims, merchants, doctors, and members of the artisanal middle class, such as goldsmiths and woodworkers, as well as women and youth. So what we're dealing with here, it seems, is not a marginal phenomenon at all, but one that was widespread and popular, involving all sectors and layers of early modern Armenian society. And then in the few minutes remaining, I just want to draw attention to one uh, aspect of early modern uh, experience that could account, maybe, or give some kind of input on uh, why scrolls. So uh, this is the factor of mobility. And I guess I don't have time to really go through this, but I just, in this part, wanted to highlight uh, certain prayers that are written specifically for merchants uh, that are found throughout the Hamayils, uh, and travelers, also especially with merchants in mind, talk about wishing profitable commerce, and then also sections, here's a talisman made for uh, a merchant, and then also special sections for pilgrims. Uh, who also obviously are defined by their mobility and travel uh, around. 
And then let me just read uh, my conclusion with my final thoughts. So I, these examples that highlight the particular relevance and application uh, Hamayil's had for certain highly mobile segments of the early modern Armenian population, I think is uh, critical. So when we highlight the factor of mobility and also recall the etymology of Hamayil as being from the Arabic root for carrying, we get a hint as to why this particular form was so attractive to early modern Armenians. They desired an object that would protect them in their uncertain voyages by land and ocean, with talismans to protect them against unpredictable and unnameable calamities, and filled with prayers that they could turn to as need arose. Further, when one unrolls an entire scroll and encounters the most beloved texts and prayers of the Armenian tradition, the four gospels, the prayers of St. Gregory of Nadek and Nersa Shnorali, and the vast array of illuminations of the principal saints, angels, and moments in the divine economy of salvation, especially the cross, one gets the impression that the Humayil also represented something more to the early modern Armenian traveling far away from home. Here was an entire culture, a religion, a universe of meaning and mystery, a homeland of text and images, all bound together in a single role and born on his own person to carry with him as he wandered as a stranger in so many foreign lands. So while I've highlighted the factor of mobility and the relevance of the scrolls for merchants and pilgrims, I think the evidence shows that the purposes of Humayil's were as varied and diverse as the people that made up early modern Armenian society itself, with all their individual vocations, needs, wishes, fears, and anxieties. Indeed, the colophons make clear that this was a literary technology and sacred object that was desirable to and used by members of every segment of Armenian society in the early modern period. has been largely manipulated in the modern Armenian history building processes. In mainstream Armenian historical understanding, he is depicted as a true intellectual, excellent scholar and unselfish political figure who supported the idea of consolidation between the two parts of Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire and Iran. However, one of the prominent establishers of modern Armenian historiography, Leo, depicted Kyomujan as the stepchild of destiny. By formulating the definition given by Leo, I would call Kyomujan the stepchild of modern Armenian nationalist historiography, which could not adopt this great innovator of Armenian history writing. Though in the second half of the 20th century, important attempts were made by Istanbul Armenian intellectuals to interpret Yeremia Kyomurjan's history writing to a Turkish-speaking reader, mainstream Turkish nationalist historiography in Eastern completely skipped and did not even discuss the possibility to shed, to shed light on the Gyabur history-telling approaches of Yeremia Kyomurjan. However, only recently Turkish academic cycles have started to pay attention to the history writing of Yeremia Kyomurjan as an important source for the Ottoman history in the 17th century. Without underestimating this attempt to reassess the value of uh, Yeremia Kyomurjan's uh, history writing, it should be noticed that Yeremia Kyomurjan still has been invisible and continues to be 
Gharib or Gharib to mainstream historiographies having been reproduced in schools, universities and mass media industries of both national states in Turkey and Armenia. In this aspect, Yeremia Kyomunjan, who according to con uh, contemporary identity politics of his time was an Armenian among Muslims and a Tajik among Armenians, continues to be a great stranger to mainstream ideologies of Turkishness and Armenianness. In this sense, one of the monumental sources of Ottoman and Armenian history writing in the 17th century, the diary of Yeremia Kyomurjan, shares the fate of its author. Yeremia Kyomurjan was born in an upper level Armenian family uh, uh, in in the 17th century. Starting from the early uh, 60-50s, um, his father on Bakum and <coughs> his father Martyrs and grand uncle on Bakum played a key role in the anti-Hmiazin political movement to create a separate Armenian Catholic society in Istanbul, aiming to centralize political and economic resources of the Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire under the dominance of a new Catholic state. Though the separatists had no the ideological contradictions against the Armenian Church and did not reject its doctrine, they had economic and political reasons to break away from the authority of the mother sea. Entering his formative years in such an environment was enormously influential on, on Yeremia. Furthermore, in the 60s-60s, Yeremia Kyomurjan himself actively was involved in the processes to establish an independent Ottoman Armenian Catholic state. Such background provides a critical foundation for understanding the diary of Yeremia Kyomurjan. Um, this diary presents the period from June 11, 1648 to October 24, 1662 in chronological sequence and necessarily recorded as such giving a detailed description of each of these years except 1651. However, the manuscript was entitled Diary by the Initiative of Levon Piralemian, a famous uh, publicist and clergyman living in the 19th century in the Ottoman Empire, Kyomurjan uh, entitled his historical um, writing, chronicle and history, Jamaina Gagiriev Batmuzun, or a book, Girk. He had a large access to the official correspondence of the Istanbul Armenian Patriarchate and was ascribed to numerous letters, papers, uh, judicial records. Also, he approaches the methods of traditional history writing. For, for example, he often refers to the Bible and famous Armenian medieval history writers and monuments. However, uh, the, this, the, the uh, traditional history writing sources are used very sporadically in the diary. Furthermore, Yeremia's work is not completely identical to the traditional genres of history, historiography or chronicle. As a history writer, Kyomurjan does not engage in the past to legitimize the political and social agendas of his social class in the present. He does not borrow his writing material from empirical content or periods of the past and goes to grasp everyday life and represent it from his perspective and from that of his political and social class. At this point in, uh, at this point in the diary, Kyomurjan tends to describe what is impossible to describe the city and everyday life of Istanbul, trying to make them readable and seen. Aiming to provide the narrativity of everyday life, Jeremia sometimes provides evidence, evidence not only on a daily basis, but also describes everyday practices, recording them in hourly sequence. Kyomurjan's diary is a news factory, consuming fragments of social dramas and perceptions of everyday life and processing them into, into the news. Kyomurjan started his diary on August 5, uh, 1649. Being uh, 12 years old, he uh, accompanied his grand-uncle Anbakum and his wife in, the pil in their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. This journey was highly important to Anbakum as he was invited by uh, Pilipos Ahbageti, the Armenian Catholicos of Echmiazin, to visit holy places of Jerusalem. 
Allegedly, the, his adoptee Yeremia was involved in this pilgrimage to record every day of the, uh, of the journey, which lasted almost 10 months. Though Yeremia Kamujan did not record every day in the diary, diary his writing test is crucial and distinguishes this historical work from the traditional historiography that previously existed. In the 17th century, the market became a social and economic nexus in Istanbul. It was the place where social and personal transactions went on, where news, rumors, and gossip flew around. Politics was discussed in the inns and coffee houses. If the emergence of a new social class of artisans and merchants in Istanbul, as well as Celali rebellion, significantly reshaped the Ottoman state politics, then the mass participation of new social strata in the public sphere crowd lower middle classes and women, polarized and reshaped the country's inner politics. Thus, the marketplace became the main source of Yeremia Kyomurjan's diary. Yeremia oversaw a bakery business which he inherited from his grand uncle. The management of the family business was the priority for Yeremia. Ample evidence shows that he uh, spent most of his time in the bakery. Moreover, Yeremia Kyomurjan recorded his diary predominantly in the marketplace. For instance, he was unable to describe the events from February 24 up to March uh, 8, 1658, since he did not visit the marketplace due to, to uh, his father's sickness. Otherwise, he visited the marketplace recording what he heard or saw there. The manuscript of, the, uh, of this diary is full of testimonies which start with warm ups such as we heard, it was heard, they told that, witnesses told that. From the technical point of view, it is interesting that Mark Mishan, uh, Maestro Mishan, <laughs> <laughs> who prepared the diary for publication, points oh, out so. that Yeremia <laughs> always had the diary on hand. Also, the manuscript is poorly organized and different types of script, paper, and ink are used. Though Kyomurjan's historical writings emerge mostly to legitimate political goals and economic interests of the Istanbul Armenian bourgeoisie, his writing enunciated the political values of, re of a rebellious and separatist social group of Istanbul Armenians. On the other hand, even being from upper classes of the Istanbul Armenian community, in the Ottoman social and political hierarchy, he occupied a lower position of non-Muslim. Even though Kyomurjan looks at the political and social life of the crowd from the elevated position of his own and judges the life of people of lower social classes, moralizing it through his social position and values, people of lower classes Criminals, thieves, drunkards, disobedience, sexual immorals, and so on appear in the writing of Yeremia. Though the author takes a selective approach to sharing everyday events in the, market, in the marketplaces, streets, squares, and other public places, he does include them in his historical writing. The democratization of the public sphere and mass cultural, cultural forms reshaped historical narratives, making them impossible to exist without the description of public processes. To conclude, Yeremia Kalmujan's diary articulates political, social, and economic aspirations of the newly emerged bourgeois social class in Istanbul. The thematic content of the diary is defined clearly. First, it describes the events of the Armenian community articulating the interest of anti echmiadzin party. Then it represents the political, social, and economic events of the Ottoman Empire. Finally, finally this diary is a repository of everyday history. Despite the fact that Kyomurjan predominantly represents uh, the everyday life of his social environment, the mass participation of new social groups in public spheres of Istanbul in the 17th century significantly reshapes the content of the diary. Also though, being from the upper middle class Armenian family, Yeremia Kyomurjan belonged to the subordinated Dimi Armenian community in Istanbul as well, uh, as, well as uh, he, was a uh, he was a head of uh, Armenian bakers. 
These aspects of his activity uh, or identity redefine his views and approaches on the political and social environment where he lived and worked. Thank you. Conference and let me start my presentation. The Crusaders opened the gates of the East to the West. This movement was the proclamation of the new era and a Romanization of the entire world. Soon after, the military invasions were substituted with spiritual expansion into the East. The main legates of this missional movement became Franciscan and Dominican orders. The Armenian world, Cilicia, the Crimean Peninsula, historic Great Armenia, became part of that project. In order to convert Armenian, Armenians to Roman Catholicism, they installed Catholic congregations and brought a significant number of the texts that were translated into Armenian. And Despite the polemic reaction of the Armenian church, large amount of that literature was borrowed and adopted by Armenians. My presentation is going to cover the issue of the adaptation of Latin literature. In particular, I will focus on the diagrams and diagrammatic images on the example of MS 1242 of the Madena Daran collection. The work map that appears in the Madena Daran's collection is widely known. The image of the map can be found both in academic publications, permanent exposition of the Madena Daran, as well as on social networks and in music videos. Almost nothing is known about the origin of the Madena Daran's manuscript as no principal colophon survives. After the map, certain scribe nurses leaves in suffering in the garment figuratum, which is widely known poetry composing style in the West, and which can be considered a unique example in the Armenian manuscript production. Like Western examples, it exists, uh, it consists of carpet letters. Inside, it has cross-armed outline, while the intersection serves as a starting point from where the same sentence, as Nurses Grichishia, can be read in four directions in the style of puzzle. You can practice yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Another scribe, Hovanes, also left a short note asking for mercy. Paleographic examination reveals yet another hand, another scratch. Due to insufficient information, it is not possible to find out who the cartographer is or the weather map is the contemporary of the manuscript. This codex has been dated to the 15th century in the catalog of the Matanadaran, probably based on its content. The manuscript is a Miscellany containing series of different texts, including as a exegetical, moral, and canonical, hagiographic, mathematical, chronological, and encyclopedic content. The first unit, written by unknown scribe, reproduces the text of commentary of Ezekiel's prophecy. The passage written by the other two scribes, Nurses and Hovannes, are connected to each other. My study of the manuscript reveals that 
the units from 6 to 14 presented in the extended catalog of the modern Adherence summarizes the well-known work called Commentary on Holy Scripture, known as Jerlang by prominent author Vartan Arevalci, almost in its entirety, sometimes back to front. There are three graphic diagrams in the manuscript. One is the map. The other is circular diagram showing the journey of the sun together with its interpretation. And the trap on the last folio, folio the family tree of Saint Anna, the Holy Virgin's mother, which is according to Latin Trinubium theory. The circular astronomical diagram and map are drawn on across an opening because of lack of space, part of the interpretation of the sun's orbit is inscribed under the map. These two diagrammatic images do not part of any text. The zodiac signs corresponding of the, to the peoples of the world, world or countries have the names of the mountains, planets, duration of days and nights, and seasons of the year are presented in the circular diagram showing the journey of the sun, the names of certain peoples mentioned in the diagram, or their cities or countries are noted on the map. The map belongs to the side of TO type European world maps of the period of Crusaders. Accordingly, right? Accordingly Jerusalem is placed in the center, in the in the form of circular city, toponyms in Asia, Africa, and Europe are indicated with the names of peoples, countries, cities, seas, and rivers, and sites of worship. Venice, Constantinople, Damascus, Baghdad, Alexandria, and Jerusalem are the famous cities that are mentioned Historic biblical references refer to the Israelites crossing the Red Sea and Moses receiving the tablets of law. Similar to European TO maps, in Armenian map, the holy sites are accompanied by accounts of pilgrims, which aim to show the former's significance. The word Tzamak, land, is inscribed next to some of the places in Asia and Africa as a guideway. In particular, such a road is drawn in the continent of Asia. You can see the mm, uh, first picture, the names you can read. Uh, from the dis distribution of toponyms and general arrangement, it is quite clear that the Holy Land is of particular importance in the map, as is the terrestrial road starting from Crimea Peninsula. The Armenian TO map, being recognized as a unique example of Armenian cartography, has drawn a lot of attention from researchers. Recently, it was studied by Ruben Garician and Tamar Boyaja. All those scholars have paid much attention to the map Many aspects of it still remain unexplored. Moreover, the map has been studied independently of the content of manuscript. The first impression is that the content of the miscellany has no bearing on the TO world map. This raises the question as to why the map was drawn in, the, in this given miscellany, together with the diagram of sun's orbit. This question has been examined in detail by Evelyn Edson in key studies of European manuscripts. The author has shown that the, that a tradition of presenting world maps accompanied by circular diagrams, in particular theotype maps, had existed in the European early medieval Computus manuscripts. Those maps and diagrams aimed and indirectly explaining the presented content. According to Edson, similar encyclopedic manuscripts contain the calculation for deciding the calendar for the most notable Christian festival, Easter. 
a liturgical calendar, calendar for the festivities, astronomical and numerical materials, and as well as text expressing the ideas of time. All the diagrams appear together and are separate from the text which they seek to explain. <clears throat> Thus, the Armenian map should be considered in the context of the Compotus diagram. It should be mentioned that, uh, that almost all materials in the manuscript is connected to above mentioned list. Nevertheless, I think that the Compotus diagram and map directly concern Jerlang. This encyclopedic work is full of astronomical and calendric emphasizes and also chronological information. In contrast with the other manuscripts containing the content of original Rav, in MS 1242, the work symbolically ends with the tale of Hovanes Bajnetsi, pilgrimage to Mount Sinai. According to this, the old monk Hovanes Bajnetsi tells the author of <coughs> Arevetsi that several of them had come to Mount Sinai from Jerusalem on the on a pilgrimage and had been treated favorable in Roman monastery because of the miracles of Armenian pilgrims who had gone there twice, 30 years ago. In these narratives, Mount Sinai is presented as a forbidden place from where prior to Armenians all had returned either demon-possessed or disabled. They also embody Yeria and Moses. A direct reference to the story appears in the inscriptions about pilgrims on the map. There are two of them. One is about a few pilgrims who reached Jerusalem, and another about the pilgrims who had gone to the desert. These inscriptions are arranged about Jerusalem at an angle followed by the word land, which indicates a route and Mount Sinai again written at the angle. The later is the only marked shrine outside the walls of Jerusalem and its importance is emphasized with the biblical reference to Moses and Hovanes Bajnetsi's tale. Evidence of the direct link of, of Hovanes Bajnetsi's tale with the map can also found in, in the phrasing. Pilgrims divided into two groups and all of the small part of the pilgrims arriving in Jerusalem. The emphasizes made in the map indicate who those the pilgrims were or where they had come from. As has been mentioned in the description of the manuscript, the map emphasizes the road beginning at Kaffa, the main city in the Crimean Peninsula. Galician has already noted that this might be the Silk Road. The later was the one of the main caravan routes passing through the Golden Horde, which had become particularly active beginning from the reign of Uzbek Khan, when the Genovese had finally established in Kaffa and Venetians in Dana. For stressing the importance of trade routes, famous trading cities and territories leading to the Far East and Middle East are presented around the caravan trade guideway. Notably, there was a sizable Armenian population in the 14th and 15th centuries in the Crimea. They were mostly concentrated in Kaffa, but also in Sukhat, El Eskikirin, in this diverse region, Armenians were divided between four Christian bishoprics, with Kaffa as their center. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Latin or Catholic, which had spread from Bulgaria to Sarai, Greek Orthodox, Apostolic and separately Armenian Unitarians, the, the art of writing developed in the developed particularly in Kaffa and Sultan as a starting point, the rule pointed out in the Armenian Tio map relates to the rest of the world and Jerusalem. Of the toponyms, Venice is interpreted in this context. 
attesting to its supremacy over Tana. In the same way, by mentioning Bulgarians, reference is being made to the Latin bishopric of the Kafa. The link to Jerusalem is given in the form of the root. The last toponym, Chorazm, is perpendicular to their destination, Jerusalem. Thus, the pilgrims mentioned in the map should be viewed in the context of the Crimea, who the pilgrims are also points the place where the manuscript was created. The map may be considered the dream of the voyager, who has recorded the journey of the pilgrims toward the Holy Land, spiritually fulfilling his oath, summarizing the study of pivotal role in the Theo world map played by Jerusalem and holy sites, I find that the map is contemporary with the manuscript. In the other words, it is the project of the compiler of the manuscript, in which he is presented as a protagonist and dream voyager. By mapping out the main stations on, on the Silk Road, with Crimea acting as a starting point, he simultaneously points out the place where the map was created. With this, he has established a spiritual bridge between the environment in which he lived and Jerusalem. On the other hand, bridging the inscriptions of the pilgrims mentioned in the map with the tale of Juanes Bajinetsi, he abstractly equates himself their Armenians mentioned in the tale. Moreover, from the study of the map, as well as from the general description of the manuscript, it is quite obvious that the compiler of the manuscript was an intellectual who had good knowledge of the Western and Armenian literature and was able to juxtapose one with another. Namely, he adopted the tradition of theocartography, circular astronomical diagram, and the diagram devoted to the sand and as well as Carmen Figuratum for, for the enciphering the name of the script. The study of the map in the context of content reveals yet another idea of the manuscript compiler following the tradition of European Computus manuscripts. He has substituted the content with corresponding Armenian literature. Thank you. organizers for inviting me to respond to this panel. I think um, I've learned so much. I think all of the talks clearly showed how much we can learn from shifting perspectives on text and asking new questions. And my own questions are mainly from curiosity and from my own training as a historian of art, architecture, and material culture. So the first talk by Jesse Arlen an old technology in a new era, the use of the scroll, the mayu, among early modern Armenians concerned the mayu, the extraordinary scroll-shaped medium that emerged in the early modern period. And Jesse, I'm going to use first names, if that's okay. Jesse poses the following questions. Who produced these scrolls? Who were they produced for? And for what purposes? How might the contents of homayos ex help explain their function and use among early modern Armenians? This talk demonstrates Jesse's careful attention both to questions of material and textual production, and it asked important questions concerning the social history of this form. Arla Jesse points out that buyers and users of these, um, these objects were priests, monks, community and village leaders, pilgrims, merchants, doctors, and members of the artisanal middle class. Um, I found this talk fascinating, not least because the Hamile tradition conspicuously draws from an ancient past. And so my first question is, to what extent, and this is something, again, entirely from curiosity, um, to what extent is this part of a broader revival in early Christian forms and ideas that's happening in, in the early modern period in, our, in, in Armenian context? And I'm thinking here of the rise of the basilica, the undulled structure, um, which is often, uh, which, which emerges in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries 
um, in, in an Armenian context. Too often this sort of return to the basilica is thought about in terms of just people forgot how to build domes, they weren't as sophisticated. Um, but then I wonder, you know, thinking about it, putting it together with scrolls, are we, could we be thinking about something larger? And then another piece to this might be the quadrilateral steles that we associate with the um, early uh, Christian period in Armenia, but they too have a revival in the 15th and 16th centuries. So I wonder, again, putting all this together, whether we might arrive at an interesting picture, perhaps connected to each other, perhaps not, but it just uh, it sparked my, my, um, my thoughts about that. And then the other thing, I wondered whether it would be useful to think across medieval cultures in terms of the scroll produ production. I was fascinated to hear about the Ethiopian scrolls, and I'd love to know more about scroll um, revivals in other cultures. I'm thinking of the Joshua role in 10th century Byzantium, and the medieval exalted roles of Europe. Um, in these cases, too, we have a conspicuous return to an ancient technology. So I wonder if there is a comparison, contrast, relation, parallel um, among these, um, these revivals. And if not, that would be interesting, too. Um, I am so interested in the, the kind of the, the function of the homayos and the practice of using them and their production in connection or in relation to icons in the Byzantine and post-Byzantine worlds. And here I'm thinking in particular about the problem of icons. Icons as essentially in 5th, 6th century icons as being dangerous, as being things that, that allow for worshippers autonomy. These are things they could go to their houses, and we know they did. And women in particular would go and, and, and worship icons. And, um, and as, as I understand it, in part, they were problematic because of that. It wasn't just idolatry, but it was about really the church um, relinquishing or not having control over the way these sacred images are used and, and worshipped and produced. Um, you mentioned that there is an evidence for, um, for, for, for church sort of complaints uh, or resistance to this homile production. I think that's interesting too because they do seem like risky objects. It seems like you could easily enter into what might be considered incorrect um, worship uh, with these objects. And so I, I I mean, it's fascinating that we don't find more resistance, to my mind, to, uh, uh, about them um, in a church context. So I, I just thought that really struck me. And then I wondered, um, I'm going to try to go, I wondered if there were, um, if there was any, any possibility of speculating on the viewing and the bodily practices in relation to them. I mean, you, you sort of did this as well, I mean, and so did Shushan. That is, how do they ask us to handle them or look at and read them? Um, you know, when you mentioned how, how tall they were, I, I love that, that part at the end where you sort of talked about how you could bring them with you and they gave you a kind of microcosm or, a, or almost a microarchitecture of, of the Armenian world that you could take with you. So that was fascinating. And then the last thing I want to say, and this is very much in relation to the conversation you were having about the, 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 the tongue swoop. Um, I have to say, I like the home saint term precisely because it is sort of destabilizing. And because, you know, as we were talking about it, these aren't just objects. They may not be human, but they're somewhere in the middle. And they, they're really unsettling that way. And I sort of like that because they aren't, they have agency. They seem in some ways to be animated. Um, so I'm just I'm just throwing that back out there. I want I, that's something I wonder about. Um, okay, second paper, um, fascinating paper by um, by Gayane um, on the diary the diary of Eremia Komurja, the writing of every day. And Gayane gives us fascinating insight into the life of Eremia and his background, and in the mid 17th century focusing on what his work tells us about the everyday, in productive contrast, I think, to previous scholarly work. Now, this paper resonated with me because I just attended a talk on 19th century Mughal representations of architecture. And in that talk, there was discussion about the ways in which the architecture in this manuscript was very much present, was conspicuous, and almost acted like a protagonist. And so, I, while I haven't read the diary, I admit, I wanted, it led me to ask, 
um, that talk and your your wonderful talk. What is the role of architecture in Emya's everyday life? How does he describe buildings from the front, from above? Uh, are they close to him? Is he talking about interiors? So what is urban architecture to him? Um, you know, and I, I like your use of the term the readable and seen for urban space. I'd love to know more about that. And this is particularly interesting to me because in, and you know, in 17th century Constantinople, at this time, we see a striking development in manuscript painting, and that is this presence of architecture. So um, uh, architecture is front and center, whether we're looking at scenes of the Annunciation or the Adoration of the Magi, there is this insistence, in a way, on the urban, the urban character of what's happening. Um, so it made me wonder, can we use Eremia, actually productively, to think about this change in manuscript painting? Or conversely, can we think about um, Eremia, um, you know, is it, would it be useful to think about Eremia in relation to this manuscript painting? So these are these are just things that occurred to me as I was listening to your to your talk. Um, you know that who who is the protagonist? To what extent does architecture get to be a protagonist in urban urban space? Get to be a protagonist in in Eremia's, um, diary. And then um, the last paper uh, by Anouche treated the extraordinary TO map, uh, which had previously been studied by Ruben Galicia, and Anush takes a different, I think, such a productive approach looking at it from a codicological perspective, truly returning the TO map to the manuscript in which it lives. And um, she traced the sources of this map um, and persuasively suggested that a Latin map in the Poitiers tradition uh, or the Armenian translation of the Compendium Historiae could have served as the possible source of the map. And I was particularly persuaded and, and struck by Anush's discussion of the manuscript, um, and particularly about this idea of the dream voyager. Um, so she writes, it is the project of the compiler of MS1242, in which he presented, he is presented as the protagonist and the dream voyager. And this remark is fascinating because it draws our map together with a range of um, other medieval European maps. And herein lies my question. So what is a dream voyager, if you wanted to speculate? How does such a voyage take place within the context of the image and the manuscript? That is, how does the image help the reader to take this voyage, specifically? And I'm thinking here, too, of um, Daniel Connolly's work on imagined pilgrimage in the itinerary maps of Matthew Paris. Um, as, yeah. Um, and then the other thing is how, and again, it's sort of like with the Hamayel, how is it used? Would you need to turn it as you were using it in order to read it? So I'm even thinking about patterns of wear on the manuscript. How, how, would, it, how would you have confronted it with your eyes and, and, and so forth? And then, um, what is the role of the diagram, as we discussed earlier? Um, why was it important to use a diagram and not a narrative text of the Holy, Holy Land in this case? Um, and I'm thinking of just, I thought of Ananya Vartavet's um, text about set the Holy Land um, from, the, from the 7th century. So, and here, as we discussed, I was thinking of Jeffrey Hamburger's work on medieval diagrams, um, from which we are prompted to ask, what is the point of storing knowledge this way? Um, how would a, the compiler or a viewer have construed the diagram with these concentric circles? And they reminded me immediately of visions of Ezekiel in Armenian manuscript traditions, and also exaltations of the cross, where you have the, the, often the patrons below. So what might have been in the kind of mental reservoir of a, of a, um, of a medieval Armenian who was encountering this and maybe seeking to take a dream voyage? Um, so that's, that's all I have. I was so impressed by all three, and, um, and thank you so much for, for sharing your, your papers. Thank you so much for such thoughtful uh, response and like thought-provoking questions. Um, yeah, there's a few there's a few different things I want to say. Um, one, I guess first of all about the connection with 
uh, that you made with icons and how these are like powerful objects and how that would lend you know authorities or church to think maybe um, such things would be outside of control and perhaps dangerous. I think those are really valid points. Um, what I was trying to uh, steer against was this assumption uh, in a lot of approaches to Armenian Christianity specifically that comes about both from Soviet era scholarship and Western scholarship. Um, so in the Soviet era scholarship, there's an assumption that, or that there's a there's a desire to find folk practices that the church was against in order to like valorize the people against the church. In the Western uh, world, there's an assumption that Armenian Christians, Armenian Christianity, function just like Western Christianity, whether Catholic or Protestant. Uh, and both of those are very wrong, I think, and misleading. Uh, for example, uh, the practice of like Madal or something like that. You, you hear in uh, Christian history that, oh, sacrifice ended you know, with the coming of Christianity, et cetera, et cetera. And then you look in the Armenian context and you see this practice of animal sacrifice that not only is uh, accepted or allowed to go on, but even have liturgical services written for it and performed by the church. So I wanted to, um, the, the Armenian situation is different, I think, in that uh, approach where there's less like uh, top-down kind of like governance of practices. Also, the church is extremely fragmented at this time and not very centralized in terms of power. There's multiple Catholic patriarchs, people moving across different borders and boundaries, and there's no sort of like major centralized oversight of, of things like this. Um, and then also, um, uh, yeah, the whole question of like why scrolls, why this form, uh, that's a really interesting thought about the revival of things and I need to look a little bit more uh, across different traditions and see like is there any kind of connection here. Um, you, I think like immediately of, uh, in the Jewish context, like Hebrew, uh, Torah scrolls, you know, still being used and having this like sacred uh, element to them, um, but it doesn't seem like immediately obvious that that would impact Armenian usage. Uh, on the other hand, from reading all of these colophons and seeing just how widespread this was and how much it was directed at regular people and not like monks or clerics, which is the audience and the people using manuscript codices. It might just be an economic question of scrolls are probably much cheaper to produce because you don't need uh, like the binding and all this other kind of like material and effort to go in to produce a codex. It's just like stitching pages together. And it could be that it's much uh, cheaper to make them. And that might have been why. Because in earlier times, it wasn't really the case that like average people got books. It was only like the high high nobles or princes or like monks and monasteries. So that's that's something that um, might be worth exploring more. Um, Shushan and I talked more in the break, and she convinced me that home saint <laughs> is the best term with its destabilizing <laughs> elements, just like you said, because the personification is so strong. Uh, for those figures, so I, I came around to that view. <laughs> um, yeah, well, those, those are, oh, oh, one last point just on usage is that it's super notable when you look at the Hamayils how much they were used, how much they were rolled and unrolled. So uh, I think like it, it definitely makes sense that over time they would more and more turn into like kind of sacred objects you don't touch because they're powerful, like you don't unroll them. But I think in the earlier period when they were being used, it was much more common to like actually unroll them and use the prayers and things. There's even a really nice painting that uh, Sylvie Marion sent me from like the early 1900s that I, I should have shown, but it shows like a woman at the bedside of her sick child and she has a scroll like unrolled all over and she's reading it over uh, the child. and. Um, there's a lot of connections with with Hamayils and also uh, 
than not egg, for example, of like how, um, again, just people assume that like, oh, this is, this is a book that like, things you read for the context, but really like, for people that had such practical purposes, like Shushan was talking about, they're meant to heal and perform, uh, perform very practical things for people. So those are all my scattered thoughts at present. <laughs> Never. 
because uh, as we can, as we know, before Crusaders, the VS knows about the Jerusalem by the writings of your Hermos, and uh, these uh, maps, uh, TO maps, were uh, were created for the purpose of uh, image of the Jerusalem to have uh, some uh, image uh, of the Jerusalem and uh, as you can see the, the toponyms are not real. These are uh, kind of diagrammatic images and uh, uh, I have no time to present uh, the other parts. The gates of the Jerusalem are six and uh, not real gates. Uh, it is the uh, the compiler takes the other tradition. Uh, so I think uh, that we have never been in Jerusalem because in the medieval time it was very difficult to go to pilgrimage to Jerusalem. As far as I know, for example, from Crimea, I remember uh, only the life of the Sad Fathers, you may remember this uh, manuscript when it was gifted to the Jerusalem. Uh, in the 15th century, the, uh, I, I tried to find the pilgrimages from the uh, Crimea. It was very difficult to find out. Uh, I found only this example. So, white uh, diagrams, uh, white is diagram because it is actually a diagrammatic image, and the map is drawn uh, with the other circular diagram. And uh, as you mentioned, the uh, Jeffrey Hamburger study, yes, he studied the Western examples of the diagrams, and I think that Armenian diagrams are the part of Western diagrams because the uh, Armenians started to use diagrams only after the Unitarian movement when the Franciscans and especially Dominicans brought uh, significant number of literature, especially uh, this literature has Aristotelian approach and uh, you can see, uh, find, for example, the tree of Porphyr and uh, uh, in the medieval texts, in the linguistic even texts, you, you can find a lot of tree type diagrams, tree diagrams, and also architectural diagrams. For example, the Ark of Covenant is considered to be an uh, architectural uh, diagram which appeared in the uh, work of Grico So, <laughs> uh, I hope I cover your yes. questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, yeah, let me to add something that uh, we know that in the 17th century Armenian community Istanbul was Alta Jemaat, which means they had like six neighbor, neighbor neighborhoods there and six churches. Uh, uh, unfortunately, two of these churches uh, don't exist now, but uh, the, uh, the others uh, exist. It's, uh, this is the Sukhreshta Kapet in Balat, uh, uh, Samatya's, um, yeah, Yoke. Uh, uh, Okay. Also, Sum Aspatatin, which is the Patriarchate now. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, yeah, these, uh, all these churches, they exist, and I believe that they uh, could uh, tell a lot to modern, uh, to like contemporary architecture of the historian. Thank you. We'll open to questions. Uh, I have a few questions to Jesse and then one question for uh, you. Uh, so, Jesse, regarding Hamayas, you know, I, I of course, for a period of time, uh, I thought Hamayi comes from the word Hamayi in Armenian. Now you're saying the source is Hamad in Arabic, Hamid, Lam, Lam. And uh, is that proof? By scholars that the that the, that the concept or the word itself is derived derived from Armenian uh, from Arabic. Sorry, this is the first question. The second one is uh, I'd like to ask you whether uh, 
certain Umayyads had more powerful, more power than other Umayyads. It is their hierarchy of Umayyads based on their, uh, based on, you know, give me 5.0, I don't want to put one, you know, more stronger protection. And the third one, and we tend to think that the Umayyad tradition has faded, but I think it still exists in a different form. So if you travel, the, the Gibrianos in your, uh, there are uh, travel uh, prayers and, you know, and, and many other things. So this is, this is, these are the three questions. And Gani, sorry, I just blanked your name in the day, you know. And Gani, the problem is, I think, here is that there's, a, there's an issue as to who owns here, you know, who owns here. Uh, Armenians say that here it was Armenian, you know, and, but how did Yeremia see himself as a, people say was a cosmopolitan figure? And you know, so that's that's another question. So who owns Yeremia? No one owns it. I think no one owns owns Yeremia. So first Armenian guy who wrote the answer. Yeah, so um, I think uh, recent linguists who looked at it think that Arabic is is preferred. And I do as well, and it's, it partly is related to that initial vow that I was mentioning, how I, of all the colophones I looked at, in, in not a single one did I find the form Hamahil without the A or A in the beginning. It was always Hamahil or Hamahil. And that points to the Arabic as opposed to Hamayam or Hamaik. Uh, the, the native Armenian group. What I think happened was, over time, when the Arabic was forgotten, it was so natural to connect it with the Armenian group uh, for a group already having to do with magic and charm. And so then that kind of took over in like the collective memory and understanding of the word. That's, that's what I think is the best explanation. Um, as for the hierarchy of like, were there some more powerful than others? I think there definitely from the was. Perspective of, the, from, think, of course, of course, from the perspective of the use. I think there must have been. There's also um, a lot of diversity among Hamayils that needs to be accounted for. So, for example, in the 17th and 18th century, they start to be printed for the first time, and the printed ones are much more like sanitized, I guess you find like a lot less of the talismans or charms and the, you know, super magical elements to them. Those are more common in the handwritten ones. And then there's handwritten ones that look like they're kind of following or copying the printed ones. And then there's ones that look like they come out of another planet or something and are like very esoteric looking. So uh, there definitely needs to be more like uh, uh, diversification and understanding of like different types of homayils and uh, this could maybe help answer the question of like the the church's relationship to them. Maybe there was like some kind of struggle between, yeah. uh, you know, which would make sense. So, and I, yeah, I think it's really important to, to realize and like emphasize how this isn't a tradition that's totally faded out. And also homayils did start to be printed as books also in like the 17th, 18th century, and there were both scrolls and books. Uh, and the Gibrianos, like the printed prayer book, is basically just the contents of the Hamayil yes. put into, printed as a book, again in a small form, so that people can take around with them. Um, also the Nareg is produced in a small form for the same reason, not just so that it's good, like you can take it around with you, but so that it actually protects you Yes. while you go around it. People still to this day use it for that reason, even like going on a flight yes. or if, for personal fears. So that, uh, that is not emphasized enough as like why, why people actually want these things and the very, very practical reasons that they want them. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no one. <laughs> but everyone can approach to him as a great uh, source uh, uh, of uh, the history of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire in Istanbul, the history of uh, the Ottoman Empire is, uh, and the global history. 
Yes. And my, my question was not rhetoric, but who wants to know? But how did my he see himself? <laughs> <laughs> how did he see himself? That's the most important part. You know? How did he see himself? See, 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 we know that there was this struggle of Nersetsi and Nersetsi, or Shehilvi, or Kavakatsi, or Gavarakan, Armenians. And yet, yeah, he uh, sees himself uh, as a Nersetsi, as uh, Armenian in Istanbul. Istanbul, Istanbul, I don't know. And Kavakatsi. Yeah. He was formerly Catholic and abandoned Catholicism to join the Apostolic Church and later uh, he abandoned Apostolic Church as well. Uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, is it correct to say that he was a secular Armenian in other period? Oh, he was not, no, he was not a secular Armenian, <laughs> but um, but the question of uh, religious identity of Kyomujan and the Kyomujan family, because we uh, know that uh, uh, this family was uh, uh, played a key role uh, in the community of Istanbul, in the Armenian community of Istanbul. Um, we, um, his brother, Komitas Kyomujan, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, we know uh, we know that he. Uh, was, uh, he was a Catholic and then he, he became one of uh, the saints of Catholic Catholic Church. But about uh, Yeremia, Yeremia's religious identity, we don't have like any uh, testimonies that he was Catholic. He belongs to Armenian Gregorian Church. Omar? Yeah. Uh, my question is for Jesse. Bedros touched on part of it, but the other part of it was, could this, what well, it now seems to be false etymology, uh, but obviously real in the sense that I assume people thought of it that way. Could that etymology, uh, real or otherwise, have influenced the, the usage and the development of these uh, scrolls, or were they always seen as Magical, or, or you know, did did the did the etymology follow the usage, or, or vice versa, or is it just purely coincidental? I think it's vice versa. I, I don't think the etymology influenced the usage. I think the connection to the Armenian root came because there was such an alignment of of the two. Um, but I think that the, yeah, I I think I think. Part of what I, I keep trying to say is that um, the the whole concept of like magic or its relation to like healing and and like the power that these had and whether the church would be like for or against that or not, I think is um, the the part of the story that isn't told so much is how much the church uses its sacred objects in such similar ways, uh, using like. Uh, uh, in, in, in the Mashtos, the ritual book, there's some of these same texts and in made for healing services that you would chant over people and you're even instructed as a priest to like put the book on top of the person so it will heal them because the power is in like the physical object itself. Um, so we think of those kind of things from a Western perspective as like, oh, that's magic or uh, these, these kind of things where like it's the object itself that bears the power or the combination of the words, but that was just, that was the whole point of, of it from, from their perspective. I, I, yeah. Are there versions of these scrolls in, in Arab cultures that use a similar, similarly derived name? Quranic versus Rukhrat? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, there definitely was. I don't know if they're called the exact same thing of Himala or, or something no. else. No. Yeah. Well, Uh, and lunch is very good. Okay, then we'll go to lunch and 